Welcome and thank you for joining us for tonight's update on the Green Line Extension Project. I'm uh, Terry McCarthy and I'm the MBTA GLX Deputy Program Manager for Stakeholder Engagement. Before we begin, I would like to thank Senator Jellin, Representative Conley, and Representative Barber for all their support and taking the time to be with us tonight. Tonight's agenda will begin with a brief safety moment, then a review of the meeting ground rules. Then John Dalton, uh, the program manager for the GLX project, will um, give a brief project background, uh, a project status, review the testing and commissioning timeline, and conduct a virtual tour of the project. At the end of the meeting, we will have a question and answer session in which John Dalton, uh, myself, and the project team will be available to answer questions. Um, this meeting um, is, is being recorded um, uh, and it will be posted live on our uh, website um, at the MassDoc.gov uh, GLX <coughs> website. Um, if you choose to participate in any uh, ID identifiable way, you're, you're giving your consent to be uh, recorded. and. Um, if you do not want to be recorded in any way, please forward any comments or concerns to our info at glxinfo.com uh, email. Next slide, John. Oh, uh, the safety moment for tonight is basically reminding folks that uh, the MBTA um, stations, uh, buses, trains, uh, we're still under a, uh, a still uh, require uh, ma uh, masks to be worn. Um, and, uh, you know, as many, many folks have seen from yesterday, we, we are going to continue uh, meeting as best we can the CDC guidelines. So um, as that moves forward, uh, there may be some possible changes uh, of an increase of mask wearing. But um, just um, just be aware, anytime you're in one of um, uh, the MBTA stations or vehicles, uh, you are required to wear a mask. Also, uh, if you need a mask um, on weekdays at Maverick Station, Orient Heights, Forest Hills, Park Street, Downtown Crossing, Quincy Center, Charles MGH, and Heinz Convention Center, our uh, transit uh, ambassadors have masks that we make available to the public. Um, and, um, you know, feel free to uh, stop in and, and uh, acquire a mask. Next slide, John. So um, we have over uh, 200 uh, registrants for tonight's um, meeting and <clears throat> We're going to use, utilize the uh, Zoom raise hand feature to allow people to ask uh, their questions uh, live. But there's uh, so many people sometimes to get through. We ask that you also type your question in the question and answer uh, dialogue. And if you don't want to ask a question tonight, we do encourage um, uh, emailing our info at glxinfo.com, which I mentioned before. And uh, you can also leave a, a recorded message at the phone number displayed on the screen. And um, when we do um, go to live comment, it will be uh, limited um, to two weeks. We'll review all questions tonight. We'll consolidate them and um, we'll have a two week comment period. Uh, so in the next two weeks, feel free to send us a, comments. 
and then we will consolidate that and we will publish the questions from tonight's uh, meeting uh, on our uh, project website. Next slide. Just um, some of the um, uh, Zoom webinar tools. I know many of us have um, uh, are pretty uh, uh, up to date on on virtual meetings, but we're going to be utilizing the raise hand feature. We're going to uh, utilize a question and answer. Um, if you dial, if you're dialing in on a phone, uh, you may dial nine to raise your hand if you had a question. And the uh, project team will answer as many questions as we can tonight. Um, but as I stated earlier, we will consolidate and uh, answer the question. And if um, your question doesn't get answered, please, please uh, send us an email or leave us a voicemail. And um, if you need or would like to use the closed cap captioning, uh, feel free to um, um, utilize it with the uh, closed caption feature. Next slide. So um, just to reiterate, we want to hear from you and um, please, um, you know, visit our website. Uh, we, we publish all the public meeting documents there. Um, send us an in, um, email and um, leave a voicemail if um, uh, you feel more comfortable with that. Next slide. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to John Dalton. Oops, yeah, and John, I'm going to. Um, start your, oops. And you your me? mic and camera should be on and I'm going to turn my video off. Can you hear me okay, Terry? I can hear you, yep. Okay, great, excellent. All right, well, uh, thanks, Terry. Thanks, elected officials who are here uh, this evening for making, uh, making, making a visit to the project uh, late last week. And also thanks to everybody who's who's tuning in tonight. It's um, you know it's an exciting time of the project. Um, it's a it's a time where we feel like we're kind of the end is in sight. Um, there's still I will caution everybody. There's a lot to do still before we get to the finish line. But um, as as I think Rep. Barber said, um, you can you can look out the window and see it's starting to feel a lot like a, a real rail transit system, which is, is exciting to be a part of. So. Um, again, I know it's a beautiful night outside and folks could probably be doing other things, but uh, just thanks for expressing and demonstrating an interest in this project once again. So um, just to, I, some of this, some of these first few slides will feel very familiar to people who have been uh, part of the Green Line delivery effort going back many years, but I just feel for those who are kind of coming into the project story for the first time, it's worth just spending a few minutes on kind of what, what it is we're doing and why we're doing it. So. Uh, just a quick history lesson on GLX. Um, the Green Line Extension was was built, was sort of conceptualized as a function of the, the, the Central Arbery Tunnel Project with the Big Dig. Um, and for those of you who don't, don't recall that, the, the Central Arbery Tunnel Project did a lot of things, one of which was bringing in additional uh, vehicular capacity along I-93 coming in from points north and west of downtown Boston, which is in this picture kind of covered up by this graphic. So by virtue of um, the additional vehicular traffic likely to come as a result of the big dig, it was required to create an alternative means of allowing people to get from areas kind of in the, in the footprint of the big dig area into Boston. And, and by that, specifically the term was environmental mitigation to um, give people another way to get downtown. And the obvious, the obvious option there was public transportation, which was sort of the genesis of the of GLX and the Green Line extension alignment sort of falls right inside this box um, that we're looking at that just popped up on the screen there. So this next slide I'm going to show you kind of drills down on that on that real red box a little bit. Um, and there will be a few you'll see this image or someone like it pop up a few times during this presentation. But again, downtown Boston's right here, kind of in the bottom right corner. The Green Line extension. Um, 
the green line, in its existing form kind of comes from points towards the bottom and off the bottom of the screen here, passes through the central business district and terminates at Leachmere station. What we are doing uh, with this project is extending it from Leachmere on two branches. One is the Union Square branch, the short branch, and the longer branch is the Medford, uh, the Medford branch, which uh, terminates right up at Tufts University in, in Medford. Um, and again, this image will come back a couple of times during the presentation tonight. Um, just a few highlights of what the, the real kind of primary delivery elements are of the project. There are seven light rail stations that are part of GLX. Uh, one is actually a relocated Leachmere station. The other, the other six are, are, are new stations. Um, we, uh, we must conform with what is called our full funding grant agreement or the FFGA, which sort of dictates, you know, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an agency receiving funding from the F Federal Transit Administration, um, we have to deliver a certain, certain, certain product, if you like, in exchange for the federal funding we receive. And that FFGA really spells out um, what the Green Line Extension must include. And it, you know, the seven stations is part of that. Um, the the multi-use community path, you see referenced below here. Uh, we have just procured 24 light rail vehicles that will be a part of the Green Line fleet as part of GLX. We need to build a, green, a, a, maintain, a vehicle maintenance facility or VMF, uh, which is also part of the slides tonight. And this is all happening inside of a budget of $2.3 billion. Some of the sort of more, more um, less tangible goals, but real goals of the project and benefits. First and foremost, and this one kind of echoes back to the comment about why we're doing GLX and all, and that is to mitigate uh, environmental impacts from, from the Central Artery Tunnel project. Uh, and that is to improve uh, local and regional air quality. Uh, secondly, a pretty kind of fun fact, um, which is really motivating is Today, um, only 20% of the population of Somerville is within walking distance of rail transit. And when the Green Line extension is finished, that number moves to 80%, which you know, is a real significant um, event uh, and kind of a, a transformative change for, for, the, for that community. Um, and lastly, just the economic benefits, uh, including the improvement of the economic tax base uh, for the three cities, uh, Somerville, Cambridge, and Medford, that the GLX will be, will be uh, servicing. Um, so here's just the project status. Um, you know, there's some pictures that come along here, but just kind of the, the route we'll take. We'll start at Leachmere. Union Square station is next. I talked about the vehicle maintenance facility. That's where that is. As you can see in the image, it just popped up. Kind of on the Medford branch, the first stop is the East Somerville station, continuing north, northwest to the Gilman Square station, coming up there. Next stop will be Magoon Square Station. The penultimate station is Ball Square Station on the Medford branch. And then lastly, the Medford Tough Station in, uh, in Medford. The, other, the small little yellow, dot, the yellow dotted line you see coming in there now is the community path. And one little interesting point here, um, just for those who are not familiar with it, you know, currently there is a community, there's a bike path that kind of runs very roughly along here uh, up to New Bedford or to Bedford uh, with the Minuteman bike path that currently terminates uh, right uh, kind of down at Magoon Square, um, more or less. And there was really no dedicated bike way from there into downtown Boston. Um, the Green Line Extension project, in, a, in kind of a, a very minimalist scope, brought the community path to a point right about just, just beyond East Somerville Station. Um, and through one of the sort of the benefits of the procurement process, um, we utilized while we were finding the design builder to, to, to design and build GLX, we incorporated some things that uh, Representative, Representative Conley mentioned a minute ago, these additive options. There were six additive options, additive options that the competing teams could propose to the MPTA um, to improve their, their, their review score as we were evaluating the competing teams. Uh, one of the six additive options uh, was extending, continuing the community path from East Somerville Station all the way into Cambridge uh, in what is now the Cambridge Crossing development area, which, you know, really allows that continuous path all the way up from Bedford along the Minuteman path down to Midland Square and now all the way along the GLX alignment into, into Cambridge and, then, and therefore Boston. So this is a pretty big pretty big benefit of utilizing this procurement process we followed among many others. But just one thing is 
this connection that is now part of the project. And you'll see images of that in, in the pictures we show, just how it's really, really coming into really coming into form. So um, just very high level overview of where the project is, just from a big picture standpoint. We are right now at the 80% complete uh, point, um, which sounds, and it is, it's, 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 uh, it's a long way, we've, we've come a long way, but these last 20% um, are, 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 not, are not without challenges. Um, and I'll talk to you about that um, as, we, as we get along further here. By the way, this picture is at the, Le the new Leachmere station. Uh, the Leachmere station is the only elevated structure on the alignment. This is um, facing downtown Boston. If you are standing on the tracks that will carry customers into Boston at Leachmere station. So uh, again, we're about 80% complete. The Union Square branch is scheduled to open in December of this year. The Medford branch is scheduled to open in May of, of next spring. And right now, on a given day, there's probably around 650 people working on the project, um, and that number ebbs and flows. But uh, that uh, that's a, a lot of work going on, a lot of folks making this project happen. This last overview image um, is is or slide is just sort of a, a, some kind of late breaking news, but it's it's pretty 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 important from a project uh, health standpoint, I would say. Um, you may not know this, but in 2016, um, Somerville and Cambridge really stepped up to the plate uh, and um, made financial contributions to the overall funding need of the project as it was assumed to be at the time. Um, the, the overall project cost was anticipated to be around $2.3 billion. Um, even with the federal funding contribution, the state funding contribution, and a couple other contributing elements, there was still a gap. Uh, Cambridge and Somerville both both uh, really stepped up and made made commitments to provide funding uh, during the life of the project. Uh, specifically, 50 million from Somerville, 25 million from Cambridge. Um, and just a little bit of inside baseball here, but these each get paid over the course of about a five-year period in equal in equal increments. Um, and so far, we've received not all that funding from the municipalities, but a good chunk of it. Um, because of where the project is from kind of a financial position, this is that last bullet there, uh, you know, really happy to say to, to, those, to those two municipalities um, and, and their taxpayers and, and others that we will not be taking the remaining uh, distributions from the two cities. And not only that, we will likely be in be returning the full value of those contributions to the two cities uh, by around the time of project closeout. So uh, again, I think it goes without saying those two those two um, cities really stepped up at a time that was critical and crucial. Uh, and it's 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 a good news story to be able to say to them, thank you for doing that. And uh, we fortunately are in a position not to have to not to have to need it. You'll be getting it back. Um, a little bit about just risks, um, you know. We are, we are, you know, I talked about that last 20% being kind of what, what remains um, before we're actually able to put the public on the trains. There, there are still risks facing the project and there's a lot of them, but I kind of distilled them down to three items listed here. Um, first and foremost is COVID-19. You know, um, just you can read the headlines and know we're not out of the woods on COVID-19. And the truth is that sort of sub bullet there talks about supply chain impacts, residual and existing. You know, we were enduring or hearing about supply chain impacts from COVID-19 way back last summer, 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 of, summer of 20, certainly the fall of 20, uh, where suppliers um, were being impacted by, you know, workforce availability, um, uh, quarantine impacts, just impacts of, of, all, of all sorts. And, you know, the news of those were coming in back in the summer and fall, but sort of the ramifications of those were not felt uh, until more recently when we were expecting to get those materials arrived on site and things of that nature. So we're still working through the residual impacts of COVID-19 on supply chain. And that would be true even if there was, even if COVID-19 was 100% eradicated and no longer, uh, no longer a thing to talk about, we would still be kind of working through those impacts. So anyway, that's still a risk. Um, jump down to that second primary bullet, subcontractor and contractor labor deployment. Um, you know, I talked about that 650 number, 650 personnel number, kind of on the process on a given day. Um, you know, just keep keeping an eye on that number, making sure the right number of folks are are out doing the work. And this last thing is sort of what we are really starting to put our focus on: testing and commissioning. You know, this project is really divided up into three primary chunks from like a, a process. We have the design process at the front end. Um, 
We had the construction process, which kind of feathered in with the design process as certain design elements got completed. And the third piece is the testing and commissioning. Um, and this is a, as you would expect, a, a big part of our ability to confirm all the systems are working properly, all the components are talking with each other, all the safety elements are functioning as they're supposed to. Um, so as the construction kind of wraps up, we'll begin this testing and commissioning effort, um, which, which, you know, is, is not without its challenges um, on any system, but certainly as we're tying in a new system into an existing green line or what we call the legacy green line. So there's risks there and just managing those as we go forward um, will be a, just an ongoing process. I do have one slide here, which I will not spend a ton of time on. This is the testing and commissioning effort I just talked about briefly a minute ago. Um, again, these five kind of steps of, of the testing and commissioning regime are kind of what we're in the thick of right now. Uh, and this just sort of takes a component from the factory until it is running on the system and supporting train service. These are the steps uh, that we are kind of in the midst of right now. Um, different components take different times. We start one test later than another component. It's just, it's all part of the delivery process. Um, and I'll add to this one thing. Um, the testing and commissioning process is, and sometimes just a matter of testing a widget, test, testing a, a circuit. Um, other tests require actually running simulated, running trains over that part of the alignment. So uh, in the coming weeks and months, um, the public will begin to see green line trains on the new GLX alignment running along the alignment. Um, and for the first, for the first, for, for a while, that's going to be support of in support of or the primary part of the testing process. So it will be very exciting to see light rail vehicles or green line trolleys running on the green line extension, but just don't um, don't immediately interpret that to mean we are we are we are um, right on the brink of opening the system to service. We'll still be a ways away yet, even when we see those uh, trains running. So recent progress on that topic of uh, trolleys being delivered. This is a pretty big milestone actually, and just occurred less than 24 hours ago. So folks on this, folks who came to this meeting are getting some pretty late breaking news. Um, last night, uh, the first of those testing vehicles, the testing trains uh, to be supporting the Green Line testing process was brought onto the Green Line, uh, Green Line extension territory. Um, this is a type seven vehicle that came over last night from our Riverside yard. Um, was delivered with without without incident without problem, uh, which is what which is what what we what we'd like to say what like to see. Um, and anyway, it's just a big move. So this actually this image on the on the left is the the Green Line uh, the Type Nine sorry Type Seven vehicle inside the new MBTA um, inside the new GLX vehicle maintenance facility in Somerville, part of the Green Line Extension project. And just that image on the right is uh, when the when the vehicle was was kind of really literally rolling off the car the, the, the delivery uh, trailer last night. Somebody pointed out just sort of this is just sort of going off the script a little bit, but the the advertisement one sees on the side of this um, trolley is pretty 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 appropriate considering what we're trying to do for the Green Line extension in the cities of Cambridge, Me uh, Medford, and um, Somerville, strengthen our community, which. I have to believe it was entirely just a matter of, of coincidence. Is that the first train we got on the Green Line VMF, but uh, vehicle maintenance facility, but it did feel like a pretty appropriate um, advertisement. Okay, so um, just some, some high level recent pictures. I think the erection of, of structural steel members are always kind of exciting. I've got two here on this screen, both at Gilman Square Station, the elevator towers. The first one is right over there adjacent to School Street Bridge. Um, and the other one on the right is the 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 south the south uh, south headhouse uh, elevator tower, also at Gilman Square. And in the backdrop there, you can see the Somerville High, Somerville High School project kind of um, uh, in all of its in all of its glory. Uh, this next slide is some additional one elevator and one uh, other pretty heavy lift. Uh, the one on the left is a nighttime um, elevator shaft direction. Um, at Medford Tuff Station, that was in May. And on the right is the uh, pedestrian bridge that will cross over uh, the, the tracks um, immediately adjust adjacent to College, Ave, College Avenue in Medford. Uh, just some additional work. Uh, this is the one on the left, Magoon Square Station. 
the one on the right is actually, it was actually probably the heaviest pick of the project, uh, crane lift. This pedestrian bridge um, was probably, it was a two crane to pick, making it what we call a critical pick. Um, and this was back in June, pretty, pretty big, pretty big undertaking. Track work, um, we are about 80% complete getting the track put down. Um, just because we put track down doesn't mean it's ready to run trains over it. That's sort of just putting it down to step one, then you come back and do all the surfacing and dressing, but 80% of the track and probably a little bit more uh, by, by today is, 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 is down. Um, and this is kind of a, a pretty much a, a kind of an ongoing effort um, across the project, uh, pretty much six to seven days a week. And this next image is pretty is pretty pretty cool. I think this is uh, on the Union Square branch. This is going to track track focus picture. This is with your back towards Union Square Station or back towards your back toward Prospect Prospect Street Bridge. Um, the one on the left was taken in November 2020. The one on the right was just taken a few days ago in the exact same location. Just to give you a sense of how things change, if you want to look a little visual reference, you can see the building here coming up kind of in, in one condition here. Uh, in November on the right, feeling much more complete, but just you can see how different the landscape has changed uh, in just, you know, not a ton of time. Uh, the noise walls have gone up along here. The overhead catenary system has, has really taken shape. Uh, what you can't see underground here beneath these manholes are uh, <clears throat> train control circuits and things of that nature. So a lot, lots changed there. Okay, um, a little bit more track. Pictures. This is a this is a great picture because it shows a lot of stuff. This is um, kind of facing downtown Boston. This is just immediately north of the Cross Street Bridge. Um, and what's happening here, kind of on the far left of the two commuter rail tracks, the the lower line tracks. The track you see really kind of right forefront here is the outbound Medford Branch tracks. So this will be a train heading out towards Gilman Square Station, Lagoon, and so on and so forth. Kind of this little gap in the action right here is the inbound track alignment. This is where the inbound track will ultimately be installed. And over here to the far right where these vehicles are parked is actually the community path. Um, Pre-surfacing pre, pre, pre um, and in, you know, not in the finished condition, of course. Um, but this is just sort of the alignment of the community path. Eventually, there'll be a track along here for the inbound track. There'll be a separation fencing along here and the community path itself will run right along here. This next image, oh, sorry. This next image is actually taken from the exact same location, just turning around 180 degrees. This is looking up towards uh, McGrath Highway, um, kind of crossing over here. Again, you can see the community path really clearly here. This is actually the community path exit ramp or entrance ramp um, leading up to Cross Street. Um, and we talked about additive options a little earlier. This, this access point for the community path was one of those five added, six additive options as well which was not part of the base scope. This contractor committed to getting this part, this done uh, as part of their trying to secure the winning bid for the Green Line Extension project. Uh, just another image of kind of all the same thing we talked about. On this side, this is up, this is looking north at this point or looking west. Commuter tracks on this side, outbound GLX track here taking shape, inbound was kind of, will sit in this space right here and then the community path along here as it makes its climb up to Walnut Street. Uh, Kind of, kind of here, and there'll be another entrance and exit point of, of Walmart Street. Through this slide in here, just to remind everybody that we are continuing to build the Green Line Extension in the shadow of an existing commuter rail track. Um, and every day, throughout the day, we are kind of making sure we are not doing anything to um, put uh, put customers at risk, put the contractor at risk, put any equipment at risk. Uh, it's just been a daily sort of fact of life for the Green Line Extension delivery, and um, it's just it, it will continue to be until we are till we're all buttoned up. Okay, a uh, little more of a drill down on some specific locations. We will start at Leachmere Station. As a reminder, uh, the Leachmere Station is, uh, sits right next to Monsignor O'Brien Highway here. The South Head House is on, on, uh, on uh, East Street. The North Head House sits right here on uh, North First Street and then uh, Water Street is over here. There'll be a bus loop being built, installed here to allow customers to make that inter intermodal transfer from bus to rail or rail to bus. Um, and by the way, just the old Leachmere Station footprint was right over here uh, across Monsignor O'Brien Highway. This next image is just um, kind of a, a higher level view. There, are, there will be three elevators servicing this station. Um, 
once we're once we're finished up. And this is um, this is called an axonometric. Sorry, don't know off my tongue very easily. Uh, image, little 3D depiction of what this will look like. This is um, you know the old the old Lechmere station footprint was over here. You got two elevators at the North Head House and one at the South Head House. Boston's off to the left in this image. And here's just an actual real picture view of that taken from atop the zinc built zinc apartment building. You can see the station off here, kind of in the in the in the distance a little bit. The platform canopy has been installed, the structural steel anyway. Um, this was this was in May, and already, excuse me, already this station is looking different. We got all the elevator, uh, sorry, the um, the canopy uh, uh, skin is on, and the roofing is on, making it feel more like a station. Uh, this is an image of where the Green Line extension really technically begins. Um, this is the old Lechmere Viaduct kind of here, the 1910 Viaduct. We demolished everything from here and to the left and rebuilt it. And uh, <clears throat> that's sort of like the, the southernmost tip of the Green Line extension. And here's another image of the, uh, the actually happening concurrently to GLX, the East Cambridge Viaduct project is rehabilitating this viaduct to, uh, to support the future anticipated train loads um, for the Green Line extension. I mentioned the bus bus loop a minute ago. Uh, this is with your back towards Boston, looking towards uh, Water Street. Um, the zinc buildings off here to the right, and this is where buses will come in, kind of under the under the viaduct, hang a left, and head back out uh, on their way uh, on their on their bus routes. Also at Leechmere, there's the North Head House on the left, uh, just how it feels at street level and at platform level facing north. You can sort of see the elevator tower. This, glazing or the art glass if you like is is already is already is already coming in and one more image of the platform canopy uh as i mentioned a minute ago this all this all this uh all the all the platform ceiling work has now gone in and now it's primarily an electrical electrical routing effort just getting all the conduits put in all the all the all the electrical systems to make the platform a functioning spot and here's that here's the south elevator we'll move on um, Union Square, make a quick stop over there. So this is a, an aerial view of the Union Square station, just to give everybody their bearings. Um, Prospect Street Bridge is right here. Uh, Boston is kind of off to the right and down. Uh, the US2 development is now clearly getting out of the ground uh, right here, which is really exciting to see. Congratulations to those folks for getting where they are. Um, and this station and all the other stations are all what we call at grade, meaning they're not they're not elevated or no, they are not. Um, the platforms will ride, the trains will ride uh, at the surface at the, at these at this station. Here's one of those um, 3D images. This is kind of a slightly different perspective. Uh, Prospect Street Bridge is right here. Um, customers will enter here uh, and exit here. This little dotted line rectangle is, is representing where the future elevator will be installed. Uh, we've, we've fortunately worked out a deal with the developer US2 to provide that elevator. So they are, uh, they are working on that and you can see that as well. Uh, this is just an image of the, of the Union Square platform station with your back towards Prospect, Prospect Street Bridge as though you're walking into the station to board a train uh, headed towards, towards Leachmere or, or downtown. Uh, this is probably not a very exciting picture for many people. This is what we call a, cent a central instrument instrumentation house, CIH, or signal bungalow, which is uh, not so exciting to look at. But this is this is this is kind of the keys of the kingdom in terms of getting a train system working properly. This controls all the track circuits, all the train signals, all the all the lighting, you know, all the all the train control systems you see are in these CIHs. There are a total of nine of them. Uh, all nine have been installed, but the installation is not the hard part. It's the wiring and the testing is the tricky part. And that's what's happening right now. This is a slightly kind of aerial view of Union Square Station, kind of taken from Prospect Street, Prospect Street Bridge. I mentioned that elevator shaft, the elevator that will be installed by US2. That's sort of what you see over here on the far left. You can see the foundation is going in already. And then just the station itself kind of runs off into the runs off into the, into the, into the background there. Okay, next stop will be quickly at the vehicle maintenance facility in Somerville. Um, this is an aerial view of that. We have two primary buildings right here. The primary vehicle, vehicle maintenance building, which you just saw an interior photo of with the green line car parked in it. And the transportation office building is here. Um, and then the rest of it is all just kind of yard space, support, support real estate for 
the storage facility for the train for the train cars. So here is how the vehicle maintenance building looks um, as of this month. Um, and as I said a minute ago, you saw an interior image of that not long ago. And uh, this is the yard itself. The transportation office building is over here to the left. The vehicle maintenance facility is off here, kind of the back background here. But the yard you can see is starting to look and feel like a real rail yard. And this is another interior image image of the of the BMF, and just a picture of the transportation office building outside. What that looks like, and we can we can move on. Okay, so next stop is just an image which I think really speaks for itself. It's just kind of this confluence area of where the Union Square branch, the Medford branch, the tracks going out to the VMF, the community path, all kind of comes into this one shared spot. And these next few images just sort of show um, what this has looked like. So this is that, this is that image. Um, taken in September, 2019. And just to give you a perspective, I'm gonna go back one slide. You look at this little arrow here, this image is taken from this direction, kind of looking looking south. So again, this is that image looking south in September, 2019. This next image I'm gonna show you is taken from the exact same vantage point um, this month. So big change. Here's the before and here's the after. So just to give you a sense of what you're looking at, uh, again, you can see your Boston's in the background there. This is the Union Square tracks heading outbound toward Union Square. The inbound tracks from Union Square kind of are, this is the Brick Bottom uh, Association building here, kind of comes from behind Brick Bottom and then comes along here and ties up into the main branch. This primary structure you see kind of coming at you out on, this, on the page is the Medford branch heading out towards points, points uh, north and west. And on the far right here is the community path. You remember I mentioned this earlier as being one of the additive options that were made a part of this project um, through our procurement process. This part of you're looking at right here was not a part of the base scope that the contractor had to provide. This is an additive option that the contractor uh, committed to providing to again enhance their score, which is you know to the benefit of anybody who ever used that. Uh, a similar image, just looking from a different direction. Uh, again, this is the Union Square outbound. Here's the Medford, Medford branch kind of heading off into the distance there. The community path is right here. And what you see below all this is those commuter rail tracks. This is the Fitchburg mainline tracks of the commuter rail system for the MBTA. You know, these there's no train in this picture, but trains are running here all the time. It's been, it's, been a, it's been a good piece of work to build all this stuff while trains are still in service. Uh, just an image of kind of how this viaduct is looking. Another viaduct image, uh, this is, um, looking kind of towards Union Square. You can't see Union Square Station here, but this is image is actually taken from the community path. I think Senator Jelen talked a minute ago about the views one can have from the community path uh, just with this aerial aerial uh, profile. And this is one of those images. Here's the here's the view of the tracks that are heading into Boston from Union Square. The outbound tracks in Union Square are kind of behind and below, kind of off the screen here uh, down this area. Uh, this is an image of the tracks, outbound tracks on, from Union Square. Here, passing overhead is the community path. And all along here, you see the overhead catenary power delivery system, which is what will provide power for the trains, uh, for the Green Line trains. Okay, next stop is East Somerville Station. As always, here's a 3D rendering of what that looks like. So just to give you your bearings here, um, Washington Street is right over here and kind of on the left running below the tracks. Uh, Boston's off to the right. Um, and the primary station is here and the community path will slip right along here. Allow folks to park and what is right here is the um, enclosed bike storage facility. If they wanna park their bike there, board the train and go into town or they can continue on here along where they'll meet up with that, that structure we just looked at a moment ago. So here's an image of the East Orville station looking north. Uh, from this month, uh, just in the very, very foreground left, you can see that bike, enclo bike enclosure facility structure right here. Still some work to do there, of course. The station itself will be right here. This is the Washington Street Bridge, which we rebuilt, um, reopened it about a year ago. But here are kind of the primary girders that support the Washington Street Bridge. And over here on the far left is the bay that will carry the community path. And the path will kind of con continue right along here, kind of going off in the distance. I mentioned Washington Street Bridge a minute ago. Uh, this was rebuilt um, 
and reopened last year, but this is kind of the before and after image of how that looked. This is just, again, just Washington Street Bridge from, from above. So let's move up to the next station, Gilman Square Station. There's a lot happening in this in this image. Um, and again, in this picture, uh, Medford's to the right, or North is to the is, North is to the right. Boston's kind of heading off the screen this way to the left. Um, so um, the community path will pass from School Street right along here, kind of elevated. Not elevated, but not at track level. Track the trains are down at this level, so the, the community path will, will will run along here. Where it'll continue on to Medford Street. There'll be another enclosed bike storage facility here. The high school, Somerville High School and City Hall, are all kind of back in the background right here, which which you don't see in this image. There'll be an elevator here, um, the, the main entrance. There will be a second entrance here off of School Street. Again, another additive option that was not part of the base scope. This elevator wasn't anyway. Um, so that was another added, added benefit that this contractor um, committed to providing. And you can see one of those images I showed you a minute ago was that elevator tower being installed. <clears throat> um, here's an image taken from School Street looking in towards Boston. Uh, again, that School Street uh, elevator shaft is right here. The other elevator shaft is here. Here's some of the high school happening here. Those of you who've been following this project for a while will remember all the retaining wall work that was done uh, for an awful long time, and still in some places, still kind of an ongoing effort. Uh, this is a, probably one of the biggest walls, well, not the biggest, but one of the bigger walls we installed to uh, widen this corridor to allow the space for the Green Line extension. And if you look kind of closely back here, this gray building, two-story building, is one of the three traction power substations that uh, are, are required to get the trains running. This is now a track level at Gilman Square Station. You are standing um on what would be the inbound track side right here so your your back is towards boston in this image uh the gilman station here the main main platform and the outbound tracks obviously be on the right on the other side here's that traction power substation i mentioned a minute ago there are two bridges we are working on here um this is a school street bridge image um and i'll, I'll flip around in a second look at medford street the school street bridge this is from last fall and you can't really see it so well because it's kind of eclipsed by the platform canopy here, but all the structural steel, the, the primary uh, driving, uh, sorry, the primary structural members are, are in place now. Uh, I think the question folks might have is, is when are you gonna open that bridge? Uh, we are looking, working, working with the city um, and making met all, 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 taking all steps we can to make sure that pedestrians will have full ability to pass over this bridge by the time school starts. Um, we have, uncovered something in one of the manholes, existing manholes, slightly off the bridge that requires one of the manholes that needs some additional work, more work than we thought, which is to prevent vehicles from passing over that bridge right away. But we do intend to have the bridge open to pedestrians by the time school starts uh, this, coming, this coming school year. So uh, stay tuned on that. Um, and this is just how School Street Bridge looks from an aerial view. Um, I don't know, probably two and a half weeks ago, something like that. So you can see the primary elements are in. That manhole I mentioned earlier is back, is back over here. It needs some additional work. Um, and by the way, the community path, just you can see it right here. This is the community path coming across um, from Sycamore Street, kind of way off to the left. And along here, people will pass across School Street, continue on, and access the station a little further down. This is Medford Street Bridge. Um, again, kind of hard to tell what you're looking at, but this is uh, taken from, from track level, looking up at the bridge. The bridge actually you know, extends way out to, off to the screen here. Uh, again, working with MassDOT and the city about optimizing the opening date for this right now, looking to get it open this fall sometime and still refining that time frame um, based upon the remaining work to go there. So Magoon Square Station is our next stop. Okay, so in this image, um, again, for bearing, for the sake of references, uh, off to the left is, is Medford, and to the right is, uh, going to the right is towards Boston. Um, this image is, is, is as though you're taking it from above Maxwell Green, looking, looking down on the station. So Lowell Street is here. Customers will enter the station here. There will be a, a, bike, a bike storage facility here. All the stations have a bike, enclosed bike storage facility. There will be this pedestrian bridge, you might remember I mentioned earlier, one of the, probably the biggest, most complex lifts we did from a crane, crane work perspective was this bridge. So that's now in place. 
there'll be uh, elevator towers here to access the station um, and customers can go inbound or outbound once they, once they get down the platform. This is an image looking north uh, um, on the Magoon Square station taken this month. Here's kind of a taken from, again, track level. If you were on the standing in the middle of the future uh, inbound tracks, you can see that pedestrian bridge. Lowell Street Bridge is kind of off in the kind of the background here. This is the pedestrian bridge I, I mentioned a minute ago. Ball Square Station. So in this image, um, this is our third traction power substation. And just sorry, let me give, tell you what we're where, where we are here. This is this is um, Broadway Bridge here, kind of diagonally. Boston Ave is right here. Um, Tufts is off to the left here, kind of off going off the screen, and then you know heading back in Somerville and, and Boston is going to the right. So um, we have our traction power substation here, bike storage here. There will be an at grade uh, entrance off of Boston Ave. Uh, no elevators or stairs necessary. There will be a second entrance um, coming off of, of uh, Broadway Bridge. Uh, this again was an additive option, one of those six. Uh, coming off of Broadway Bridge, elevator, stairs to get down to the platform uh, and so on. This is an image of that station that taken from ground level um, this month. Uh, look again, looking up towards towards Tufts in the distance, in the far far distance. Traction power substation right here. Um, noise wall panel, noise walls over here, not yet finished. Um, and right behind us in this image is is the elevator. And here's kind of looking the other way. Here's Broadway Bridge again. Broadway Bridge, like Washington Street Bridge, was closed for closed for a while. We reopened it um, a little more than a year ago. Here's the here's the here's the elevator tower for Broadway Station. Uh, stairs will come down kind of in this little envelope, and then customers will access the station that way. And here's a little more of a bird's eye view uh, of this area. The last stop is going to be Medford Tufts. Here's a artist rendering, an architect rendering of what Medford Tufts Station will look like if you were standing on Boston Ave. Um, kind of looking across the tracks towards towards uh, Burgett Ave. So again, give me a second to give you your give you your bearings here. So Boston Avenue is over here, kind of on the, on the far right side. Uh, the new Tufts building, Cummings building, is kind of in the foreground here. It's not shown on here, not depicted on here. And then College Ave is kind of like right right, kind of off the screen here. So the main entrance will be coming off of Boston Avenue here. There'll be two elevators. Uh, you can see those elevator towers are, are, are installed now. The primary entrance will be, sorry, the primary station platform or the, the station platform will be right here. And there will be an emergency egress structure, uh, which has really taken shape in the last month or so down here at the far, at the far end. <clears throat> So this is a this is one of those before and after images. This is uh, taken uh, in July 2019. Again, you're looking kind of on top of the Tufts parking garage, looking towards College Ave. Um, and this is that same image, almost um, almost the exact same location, um, just this 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 month. Excuse me. Here you can see the two elevator towers coming in. The station platform before it had any structural steel erected is, is here. And if you look at the next picture, it, it ha is after the structural steel, the station platform canopy has been installed. Um, we still got to put the, the primary ceiling members in, but uh, you get the idea that, that you know, not a whole lot of time from July 7th to July 14th, that station platform changed pretty quickly. This is platform level looking, looking back towards College Avenue, Tufts on the left. Uh, again, retaining walls, huge part of this project for an awful long time. Um, and this was, I think this, I think this is the second tallest, I think, that, I think the tallest retaining wall, if it wasn't this one, is a school street, um, just north of school, between school and second one. So I think that gets us to the end of the presentation. So I'll stop talking and um, look forward to taking any questions folks have. Thank you, John. That was uh, great. <clears throat> There are a few uh, questions in the uh, Q&A box. 
Terry, I'm happy to summarize or yeah, Aaron, please feel free to jump in if you'd like. Yeah. Um, we, uh, we have uh, seven, eight now open questions. So I'll go through them uh, quickly. The first test train will be a historic event. Will there be a public announcement? Uh, you know, is this going to be, uh, you know, ceremonial uh, event? And uh, yeah, um, we had not intended to um, make any kind of ceremony about it. Um, not to say we wouldn't. Uh, I think we'll probably put out some kind of notice, either at a minimum, some kind of Twitter Twitter announcement of it. Um, I think the actual the actual date we'll be doing it is going to be kind of fluid, um, right up until the day we actually do do it. So, um, but I think we'll definitely be making folks aware that, um, like, as we try to often, you know, little things we think will be of interest to the community, uh, we will we like to put put words out, put messages out ahead of time, or as soon as we're done. So that will probably be what we what we do with this test train as well. Okay. Um, sorry. Uh, GLX runs alongside the commuter Lowell rail track. Um, would it be difficult to add a future commuter rail stop along GLX? Um, I mean, I think anything's possible. Uh, I mean, the short answer is, the answer is it's possible. Um, would it be difficult? I'd say yes, <laughs> just because the challenges that we've faced, uh, of course, it's a totally different undertaking to put a station in for a commuter rail um, than the whole GLX alignment. But, um, you know, this corridor is so tight and we learned that, we've learned that lesson all along here, how tight it is. So putting in an additional station, uh, Elsewhere on the commuter rail alignment, the low line alignment, as the, as the question is asking, would uh, likely require some kind of real estate taking at a minimum. Um, and, um, you know, I'll probably leave it at that. I think it's, it's, it's possible and doable. It's difficult. Yes, it is difficult. Um, and I don't think there's any current plans to, to, to add anything uh, of that nature at the moment. Okay. Um... When you mentioned fencing between the tracks and the community path, does that include an acoustic buffer? If not, have you modeled the expected decibel level experience by path users? Uh, the short answer to both, I think, is, is no. Certainly the first answer is there is no acoustic buffer between the light rail trains and the um, community path. Um, and there's been a substantial amount of acoustic analysis done on the project, um, which we're, you know, we're complied to, to do to ensure we're not um, uh, uh, adversely affecting um, abutters um, or communities adjacent to the to the new the new alignment or the, the changed alignment. Uh, and I don't, I just, it, I, truth is, I don't know if a study was done between the green line, the light rail tracks and the commuter, uh, sorry, the community path. Um, but that's the question we could, we could research and, and, and get back to the, the, the questioner. Okay, next question. How do you access the East Somerville station from the community path? I think we went over it uh, in general terms, but. Um, so the, uh, the path will pass by the East Somerville station main entrance, um, as one comes, you know, say from Gilman Square towards, um, towards East Somerville station, you'll, you'll pass along the right of way, you'll cross Washington Street Bridge, uh, and the path will, you know, provide a, a turnoff, if you like. Um, to to allow people to either you know park their bike in the in the closed bike storage facility or an, an external bike rack, um, so it'll just be part of the part of the access way effectively for that's not different from what non bike riders will use or people who aren't coming off the community path. I hope that answers the question. With the heavy rains over the past month, how has the drainage installed as part of GLX performed? That's a great question. Thank you for whoever asked that. Um, um, it has performed very well on the main alignment. 
um, the place where I, I, um, um, I'll be glad when we're done with this part because we're not done yet, but I think it'll make a big difference is the stretch right below Washington Street Bridge, um, right next to the uh, Oliveira's Steakhouse there. Anyway, um, you know, it rained, one of those recent rain events, uh, there was flooding there. The good news is the the drainage system we've, we've installed for that that portion of the project is not yet online. Um, all the all the all the infrastructures in the pipes in, however the the pumps and the things that really you know do the work have not been have not been commissioned yet. So we have some temporary pumps there that are trying to do their do their job, but the capacity of those pumps is substantially less um, than what the the final pump. Uh, capacity will be like orders of magnitude different. So, I think once, once um, you know, once those pumps are installed, uh, it, there won't be a there won't be a problem. But to answer the original question, the the primary um, drainage system along the alignment, which is another big undertaking for those of you who remember, those of y'all been here a while, <clears throat> you know, there's the 60 inch drain line, a 60 inch diameter uh, drain line that runs pretty much from Central Avenue. Uh, Central Street down to uh, Medford Street, uh, and it took an awful long time because we had a lot of rock, and it was a pretty big, pretty big effort to get that in. And that system is performing, it's performing well. Okay. Um, <clears throat> this is a scope question. Uh, when will improvements to streetscape? and public realm adjacent to new stations be finalized? Is it part of the GLX scope or the responsibility of neighboring cities? Uh, it's a good question and it's not an easy answer. Um, there are certain components of adjacent streets, um, street crossings, even the signaling, you know, street crossing signals and things of that nature that we've, sh we've, we've worked with both Somerville and Medford to kind of share who does what? So it somewhat it sort of depends which intersection you're talking about and which street you have an interest in. But the short answer to the question is um, the surrounding areas, um, the areas immediately surrounding where we've been working, will be you know, restored to their their prior condition or or better. We have a question from Ball Square about the uh, existing uh, gaps in the sound wall and when will that wall be completed at uh, Ball Square Station? Um, so like with pretty much everything, the project has a handful of milestones. Um, the milestones that get the most attention, I think, are the ones for revenue service. So. That's for branch one is December this year and branch two is, is May of, of, of next year. There, are, there will be other, there will be work that goes on after, um, after branch two is in revenue service. Uh, for example, uh, the community path. The community path will most likely not be open for, for use uh, at the same time that the Metro branch opens. Um, uh, because for most that that path is going to be a very important access way for getting the work completed on certain parts of the project. So, the next sort of critical milestone is what's called substantial completion, and then final closeout. Um, final closeout is July of 2022. So all these little loose ends, whether it's whether it's you know repairing streets, like the previous question asked. Um, getting all these infill panels put in, opening the community path. Um, all of these things at the very latest will be finished then. As far as when between now and then, exactly those panels we put in at Broadway's, at uh, Ball Square Station, um, if I, I, I don't know. But, John, uh, I, John, I can uh, bring a little update to that. I was yeah. at the, the construction meeting today and panel placement is gonna start as early as tonight. Uh, and we'll continue on for uh, probably at least a week or two. If, if we're talking the ones in Medford, I assume along New Bern, Morton, that that uh, panel placement is about to get started. So it's it's been a while, but uh, it, it is getting started. Great news. Uh, 
Another question about the community path. What is the longest stretch of the community path without an exit? Has the team installed any safety measures, blue lights, et cetera, or is that even a concern? I don't know the answer to the first question. Um, I don't know. Um, that's something that we could research and figure out pretty quickly though. Um, and as far as I think it's worth remembering, and this is just a, an interesting kind of fun fact, the original, the original um, concept of the community path is very different from what's being built right now. Um, for, for example, the community path right now, um, A, it has those additive options we talked about, right? The one that flies over the, the Fitchburg tracks down kind of um, as Thornville transitions into Cambridge. We have that additional entrance or exit at, um, at um, Cross Street. But also the path was originally foreseen to be much more built at track level. So the entrances and access points that people will have now include School Street, uh, Sycamore Street, um, although there's always kind of one at Sycamore, I think, um, Walnut Street. These are all places where the path will intersect with at street level, which, you know, I think it doubles or maybe even triples the, the access points that compared to what the original plan foresaw. So, um, there was a question, the following question with the blue light things. Uh, we are, we have worked with the city to make the, the community path, um, accoutrements along the community path that we are building be consistent with what is being built or what is, what has been built on other parts of the, of the, of the path that are at Somerville. So the, the frequency of those call boxes or, 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 you know, those other sorts of components are, are, are consistent with what, uh, one would see on the existing community path. Great. I, I believe they're spaced at a thousand feet, uh, but I feel it's a good time to mention all of these questions. Uh, first of all, the recording of this entire presentation and Q&A will be up on our website. Um, but we also go in and uh, type out answers to all of the questions that we receive and we publish them as well. So. It takes a couple of weeks to get that up on the uh, website, but please note if there's something that we cannot answer here, it will be answered in writing on the website. And so with that, I'll go to the next question. Uh, when the Medford line opens, will it be using both tracks or running only on one single track in both directions? No, when the system opens, it'll be both, both tracks. Um... One, one track will service inbound trains and one track will service outbound trains. Now that said, um, part of the design and what's being constructed now do allow for trains to switch switch sides if necessary, which is pretty typical. If you have a disabled train, you want to be able to, to, to maneuver around it. So um, there's a handful of those opportunities being built, uh, of those crossovers being built into the new, into the new alignment. Okay. Um, another scope question, uh, there's been a couple of questions on Route 16. You know, are there any future plans to extend the Green Line to Route 16? Um, and will, you know, that extension, if it does happen, include a bike path, et cetera? Um, I, this, this project team, you know, myself and the folks I work with um, have not been a part of discussions about Route 16, um, so I, I'm afraid I can't. I can't say. I, um, someday that sounds like a great thing, uh, but I just this this team has just not been a part of those of that effort. Great. Um, let's see. Uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, it's a, one of the largest public walk works projects. As part of the project closeout, will there be a public performance report that delves into the project performed compared to target? If so, is there a timeline known for that? Um, I know we are required to provide what's called before and after study. Um, it's part of the FTA requirements, uh, which I'm, I feel will have some, uh, some part of 
plan versus actual um, information in it. But I'm certain this project will be studied um, by by various um, entities um, as far as how things finished, where they were, how things started. Um, but I think our our just our technical obligation to answer this question is that before and after study I, I mentioned a minute ago. Okay, thanks. Question we we get quite frequently: um, Is it true that the Union Square line will be part of the E branch, and the Medford Tufts be part of the D branch? And why were they chosen that way? Hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna phone a friend on that one, uh, Terry, or can yeah. someone else help me with that, please? Yep, the uh, Medford branch um, uh, will be the E line and the Union branch will be the D line. So it's reversed on what the person is saying there. So it's E line for Medford and D line. But as we start opening sections, you know, that, that does, um, that, that will have to stay flexible within the dispatching of trains and alike on uh, heading there. But most of the um, green line operations at the center um, uh, stations like Park Street, um, uh, trains could be on one line and, and switch to another. But uh, in the end condition, um, it will be uh, E branch for Medford Tufts and um, D branch for uh, Union Square. Great. A um, <clears throat> couple of a uh, couple of more questions. Uh, how many LRVs have been delivered? I think John went over that. The first was last night. We're expecting two more during the uh, testing phase. Um, let me let me let me let me elaborate on that just a second. Yeah. Um, so one of the earlier slides included a reference to our um, procuring 24 light rail vehicles. Um, all 24 have been delivered to the MBTA, um, and many of them are actually already in service. If, if, you, if you're a frequent Green Line rider, you, you've probably ridden on one. Uh, but all 24 are, are now in Boston and um, in different, I think 23 of the 24 are actually doing their job and they're, they're being put out in the fleet. Um, the, the last one is just a normal sort of burn-in testing testing process. Uh, but like Marty was saying, uh, we got one of the, one was delivered last night and in the coming week or so, we should see the, the, the final two that we need to, to initiate the whole, the whole uh, testing process. Great. Has the retaining wall at Medford Tufts Station been fully completed or is it, or is there additional work to do on that step? Uh, I, it is certainly structurally complete. Um, I know for a while, and this is probably finished now, but there was some additional sort of drainage work that needed to be put in at the top, kind of right off the, off the, off, off the, kind of the top of the top of the retaining wall, um, between the wall itself and Boston Ave. Um, but I think the, the primary work on that wall is, is finished. Another one uh, on flooding uh, or stormwater. Interesting uh, active pumps. Uh, if the power goes out, the flooding could become a problem at the worst possible time, correct? Are there backup power systems installed to mitigate this risk? Yeah, we, we have um, generators uh, available when and if that would occur. And we've, and we've used generators on this project multiple times for different things. So. The availability, the availability and deployment of, of electrical generators is, is something that is pretty typical and something we've 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 done on different 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 spots. So yeah, good question. Another comment on uh, sound walls. Uh, any idea when the sound walls are going in at Rogers Foam? Jeff Wagner, you want to you want to bail me out again on that one? I, I don't have a certain answer on that. Yeah, uh, and, and I don't have a specific one on that, John, too. I know um, wall placement is going to be active uh, through through the fall and uh, through the end of the year, in fact. And, and I wanted to clarify my answer before on Ball Square that while we are putting in noise walls uh, panels starting uh, tonight, that process is, is going to take uh, 
a couple months to, to get all the way to uh, Granville Avenue. So that I think that's one, uh, the Rogers Foam one that I'll need to follow up on. Great. Well, I think we've exhausted uh, all of our questions at this point. Uh, so I'm going to hand it back to you, Terry, for the time being. Oh, uh, thanks, Marty, for uh, going through the questions. Um, one important thing I wanted to mention, um, we uh, have a very active community working group uh, working on this project. Um, they have been kind of a backbone of public outreach and um, answering questions within the community. And I really want to thank, thank them. There's a few members uh, with us tonight, but um, we've had 45 consecutive monthly meetings with the community working group. And there's been good attendance at each meeting and uh, we haven't missed one yet. And we're going to continue um, uh, with the community working group meetings, but um, you know, this is probably our last major construction update. The next time we'll be talking about opening up um, um, the uh, Leachmere and Union Square Station, but um, uh, pretty much everything's going well. And uh, it was a, uh, a big deal last night. Marty and I um, helped with moving the Green Line vehicles from our Riverside facility to the GLX vehicle maintenance facility and it's it's a, a big uh, big push forward for the project. Uh, one more question Terry from uh, Brick Bottom residents mm -hmm. um, and I've gotten this before uh, is the worst over? Um, I, I wouldn't want to say that what we will still continue to be working at night, um, uh, probably right through to the end of the project um, because of the restrictions in working around the commuter rail and uh, just access to resources, night work will continue. Um, and, uh, you know, heavy work like drilling and rock excavation and items like that are, are completed, but there's a certain element of noise, you know, working with the OCS poles, uh, track and, and other elements. So um, I, I don't know if I, we can um, say that disruptions uh, won't continue, but um, they'll, they'll, they'll be um, different and less frequent, but they, they will continue um, for right into next spring. Okay, here's another one that comes up a lot. Will there be turnstile fare collection at each station? Um, actually, uh, the GLX stations uh, will not have a standard uh, turnstile um, um, entrance. The um, GLX is actually in a good position of, of being involved with our um, uh, fare collection transformation, sometimes people know it as 2.0. Um, we, we are kind of going to be uh, in an interim condition, um, sometimes referred to as 1.5, but we'll have um, fair vending machines and fair validators in our lobbies. And then uh, people will continue to the platform. And if you have validated your um, um, card, you will just uh, enter in on the on the train. If you hadn't validated, you could go to the front door and like. But that that all hasn't been um, completely decided exactly which options. But I, I can confirm there will be no turnstile type of setups. Thanks. Got a question here on roofs. The uh, attendee is concerned about. Uh, wind and rain in uh, strong wind events, uh, you know, hitting uh, passengers. Would a two foot wide extension that is angled down at 20 degrees, like an airfoil, be effective? Um, I, I do not think so because the um, canopies are designed um, 
for uh, wind loads and um, uh, designed to handle the capacity of snow loads. The um, reason they angled down is it's much easier to have the rain go to a center drainage system than possibly dripping over the edge either onto passengers or as they're entering or exiting uh, vehicles. That, that's the reason for the, the Y shape. And um, no, uh, I don't think there's a concern and um, uh, no, I, I don't believe a foil is, it would be um, appropriate. Got a question from Magoon Square resident asking if the inaugural ride or the, you know, the opening slash ribbon cutting, uh, you know, can involve the local communities. It, 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 um, it most certainly can. Um, the MBTA recognizes that um, many of these stations have been a great neighborhood input point. And we are very much um, pro having the communities and neighborhoods involved with the local stations. Um, just an example, the Gilman Square um, neighborhood would be in, um, invited um, to participate and uh, uh, celebrate the opening of that station. So uh, same with East Cambridge, um, Ball Square, Medford Tufts, um, we, we will look to involve the local communities that live around those stations. Thanks. Another question here about uh, the future connection to Porter Square and whether the project uh, precludes that, does it uh, you know, include it in any way? Actually, uh, th that's a good question because um, it was asked earlier about an interconnection with the commuter rail. We're, we're not doing anything that would preclude the connection to Porter Square, um, but uh, just as we've had to modify so many bridges um, along the um, Lowell commuter rail line, uh, we would run into the same issue along the Fitchburg line that we would need to re reconstruct and widen several bridges to make that uh, connection. But the GLX project has not precluded uh, doing that in the future. Uh, another question here, which I don't think involves GLX, but is there any uh, connection or similarities between the orange and red line uh, renovations in the GLX? And, uh, no. you know, are there any similar issues? No, uh, no, um, the, the red and orange line um, work is, is, is state of good repair and improvements. The GLX um, project is, is brand new infrastructure. It is also light rail vehicle uh, infrastructure, which is different. Uh, you know, it as everyone knows, it has a catenary line um, overhead where the red line and orange line are uh, third rail, heavy rail systems. Um, but there's really no correlation between um, GLX infrastructure and um, red and orange line. Okay. Uh... Marty, you had asked a question earlier about the longest stretch of the community path. And I yeah. believe it's from East Somerville to where it touches down in Cambridge, Correct. Uh, which would be about 3,600 feet. So I think it's yeah. uh, about a little less than uh, three quarters of a mile. Right. And I, I think there's, uh, there's a series of call boxes. We can go back and check uh, how far away they are. I believe they're 1,000 feet apart. I, I believe that's correct, uh, Marty. Yeah. And, yep. Yeah. Uh, here, this is a resident from Glass Factory. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned about noise and air pollution when my windows are open. Um, will there be any vehicles sitting on the track that would cause extra noise or air pollution? 
Um, no, it's an electrified system. So there's no type of fuels or anything um, being um, uh, burnt or consumed. So it's, a, it's totally um, electric DC power. Great. Well, I think we've gone through the, uh, the list of questions. Uh, is there anything to add or anything that I'm missing at this point? I don't think so, Marty. We'll, we'll see everybody in a few months when we cut the ribbon. Great. Well, thank you. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone, and, for attending. Yeah, and uh, please, uh, if you have further questions or need further information, uh, please uh, send us um, um, email at the um, email address that was provided tonight, info at glxinfo.com. Okay, everyone, thank you.